early on the first day of the week while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had, ris- had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God add his blessing to his word. You can be seated. Ron Howard directed a movie last year called 13 Lives. I don't know if you saw it, but it rather is an tremendous story. It's a true story where he recounted in 2018 a soccer team in Thailand and their coach explored a cave system. But as they were exploring the system, uh, it suddenly began to, to rain heavily. And so the water in the cave began to fill up so much so that the young men and their coach were trapped. Now, there's a whole lot to this story, but rescuers then, over several days, found that they were, in fact, alive four kilometers deep within the cave system. And so, after a six-hour harrowing and dangerous dive, these rescuers were able to get to them, but realized they have very little oxygen, they have very little food, and no light whatsoever. In fact, one of the rescuers died in attempting to to get to the team. And so all of these things were, how do we save these young men? How do we save this team? Uh, Well, there were divers that could get to them, but these young men didn't have diving experience. They didn't have any idea how to, to, to expertly navigate the dangerous terrain. What would you do? Well, interestingly enough, someone came up with a rather innovative solution. They decided to sedate the boys, to put them to sleep, wrap them in a bag, attach oxygen to their faces, and then bring them out. And so one by one, they were literally dragged through the darkness for six hours asleep, and every one of them was saved. Now, it was a modern miracle of community and love and determination. Later, I found it very interesting, it was learned that the coach and three of the boys were stateless. In other words, they were illegally in Thailand. However, the government granted them a reprieve and gave them official citizenship. Now, I want you to imagine, as a parent, if you discovered that your son was alive and he had been saved and he was, uh, he was okay, 
Can you imagine any better news than hearing that? This morning, I want to report to you, I have great news too. The truth is, it looks dark in our world. Our time is indeed slipping away. But someone has come out of the darkness to show us that if we trust him, there is a way out of the darkness into a marvelous world of light. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Follow me, and I will give you citizenship in my kingdom. Now, in John chapter 20, I want you to note that we see three different reactions of people who first saw the Lord after his resurrection. And I'd like us together to think about not only their reactions, but what is our reaction to this news today that Jesus is alive. Well, Mary Magdalene, it turns out, John reports, is the first person to encounter the risen Jesus. Now, I want you to just notice her emotions during that day. She gets up early in the morning before dawn, braves the dark streets of Jerusalem in desperate grief to make her way to the cemetery. Mark tells us that Jesus had cast out seven demons in Mary. Some people think that she was a prostitute, but the Bible never tells us that. But we do know this. She owes Jesus everything. He had made her whole. He had given her forgiveness and self-worth, and she loved him intensely. The crucifixion had crushed her. And so that morning, she carried spices to to care for his body as one last act of devotion to a man that she cherished now i think about this story and i notice that she probably wasn't thinking too clearly grief does that because after all there were guards at the tomb and there was a huge stone there there was no chance that she was actually going to be able to minister to the body But to her shock, when she arrives, the stone, in fact, has been rolled away. There are no guards to be found. She looks into the tomb, and it's empty. What would you do? Well, Mary turns around, and she heads back to the city to inform Peter and John in frustration and anger. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. And together, they run to the tomb to investigate. Peter and John see the tomb is empty. Well, they head back to Jerusalem, bewildered. But Mary decides to linger. She peers again into the tomb, and this time she sees two men there, casually sitting in white, and they ask her, Mary, why are you crying? And she begins to sob even more. They have stolen Jesus' body, and I don't know what they've done with it. Why would they humiliate him even more than this? And so verse 14 says, suddenly she turned around and, saw that Jesus was standing there. But she doesn't realize it was Jesus. Now, if you read this passage correctly, I think, you really get the sense of the playfulness of Jesus here, don't you? Mary thinks he's the gardener. Maybe maybe she's blinded by the morning dawn. Maybe her eyes are so weepy that she's just not seeing clearly. Maybe Jesus has just uh, somehow concealed his identity. But I love the fact that she thinks he's the gardener. Because she's not wrong. I want you to know this morning, it turns out that Jesus really is a gardener. In fact, one way to think about the Bible is as a story of three trees. In the beginning, there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden, wasn't there? 
garden was full of trees and they were good for food and pleasing to the eye. There's no curse yet. And, and then Adam and Eve are given responsibility and they're told to tend the garden. And you remember, God would come in the cool of the day and he would have fellowship with them and they would tend the garden together. He created the garden just for them. In fact, the, the very first sin was disobedience with one of God's trees. And so the curse came. Then you have in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, the, the tree of life, we see it all over again. We learn, in fact, that all of history is getting us back to the garden. That's what history is about. And so it, it, it describes this tree here with a, with a cluster of fruit. We're told that the tree will produce a crop every month. In other words, the picture there is of a creation working, right, flourishing, overflowing, abundance. And it says in Revelation 22, and the leaves of that tree will be for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. So creation will stop groaning. The gardener has accomplished his work. But in between the first tree and the last tree stands one more tree. The Bible says, cursed is the man who hangs on the tree. And on Good Friday, of course, a righteous, perfect man, God himself, took on the curse in Jesus Christ. You remember he surrendered himself in the garden. And so when he died on that tree, it got real dark. The earth began to quake. The curse began to die with him. And when he rose from the grave, a new creation began in him. And so the tree of death becomes to us a tree of life, the cross. So Mary Magdalene isn't that far off. She's not mistaken when she sees Jesus and she thinks he's the gardener. I wonder if you looked around this morning on this beautiful spring day as the blossoms are blooming and the trees are unfolding their leaves and all the glory of this morning. She didn't make mistake Jesus for the gardener by accident. I think on that day, nature itself perked up in all its grandeur and beauty and became even more amazing because he was a gardener and still is. But notice she doesn't know it's Jesus until she hears him speak her name, Mary. Mary. And suddenly for Mary, there's this emotional somersault. Her eyes are open. Her heart bursts with joy. And she embraces him. Imagine her emotions in that moment. She went from no hope that Jesus was alive to, to squealing in delight as she grabs him and she keeps clinging to Jesus, so happy to see him and know he was alive, to the point that Jesus finally says, stop holding on to me, Mary. I, I've got a job to do and so do you. I want you to go back and tell my disciples what has happened. And so verse 18 says, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. I want you to think about this with me. You see, Mary's reaction to the empty tomb and to the risen Jesus was an emotional one. For her, feeling was believing. She wanted to hold on to that moment of ecstasy and joy because for her, feeling was believing. You know, many people today evaluate their faith based on their emotions. You know, maybe someone here this morning, years ago, you had a genuine, really sincere, emotional experience when you felt especially close to God. 
you accepted Christ and you were on fire. Maybe it was at a Christian camp. Maybe it was in a, in a, a, a youth event. But you were, you were just on fire, on fervor. You were, it was like nothing else you had ever experienced. It was glorious and good. But if you were honest this morning, over the years, the emotion has faded. And in fact, you're kind of disappointed you don't feel as close to God as you once did and the reality is you just kind of backed off you backed off from church you don't pick up your Bible very often if at all you don't pray unless something is really really wrong and you wonder was it all real was there anything to it the truth is I know Christians who spend much of their lives trying to get back to that place and so they go to this concert and that seminar they go from church to church to church just hoping they'll get that emotional spark that emotional fix we can falsely base however what we believe on what we're feeling but you know there's a problem with emotions isn't there emotions fluctuate I don't think God ever intended us in the Christian life to, for it to be one continuous high there are valleys as well in fact I, I'm a little suspicious of those folks who are always saying praise the Lord isn't it a wonderful day I'm so blessed in fact if I'm honest I'm a little annoyed at those kind of people <laughs> maybe you are too because we aren't people who base our faith on our feelings and emotions you know one of the greatest emotional moments of my life was when Ohio State beat Miami in double overtime in 2001 for the national title I had never seen that happen I didn't know if they would ever win a title it had not happened to that point in my lifetime and so that night in double overtime when they finally won that game in extraordinary fashion I let out a whoop I was excited I was hugging and celebrating yes 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 jumping up and down I could not have been happier and and, and I taped that game you remember VCRs and VHS I happened to tape over my wedding with that game yeah but at least it was a good game I mean come on but you know what happened afterward I watched the tape several times and have watched that game several times across the years but here's what I discovered it's still fun to watch, but I skip over some parts. I, I'm happy they won, but I don't feel the same way. And that reminds me, you know, emotions can be remembered, but they can't be replicated. And over time... I guess my point is emotions are not meant to be maintained here for decades or even weeks. Jesus said, Mary, we can't stay here. You want to hold on to this. You want to hold on to me, but there are things we are called to do. Your faith has to be more than emotion, more than feeling. Now, John says there was a second group of people that Jesus appears to. A little later in this chapter, there are 10 disciples who are in the upper room who have the doors locked because they are fearful of the Jewish leaders. Now, I would submit to you that their response is seeing is believing. The disciples had heard that Jesus was alive but they were afraid because they didn't know what it meant or what they were supposed to do. Now, at this point, they had evidence. The, the stone, it had been rolled away. There, there was no body in the tomb. There were grave clothes in the tomb, nicely folded, as a matter of fact. And I'm thinking, what kind of grave robber is going to take the time to do that? And then there were these eyewitnesses, these women of all things, Mary Magdalene, who had told them that he was alive. 
Oh, and by the way, they suddenly remembered, you know, he did say he was going to rise again on the third day. They had all these evidences, and in spite of all that, they locked themselves in a room afraid. Verse 19 says that Jesus shows up, and notice if you read it, he doesn't bother knocking. In fact, he doesn't even bother opening the door. He just kind of shows up, and that'll get your attention. If you were afraid before, what are you feeling right now? But Jesus conquers their fear. Peace be with you, he says. And he shows them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed, the scripture says, because they saw the Lord. That says to me that for them, seeing is believing. You know, I find it interesting to those who doubt that Jesus really rose from the grave, yet they believe that our country, the United States, experienced the Revolutionary War or that we went through the Great Depression, or that we grappled with the sin of slavery, in spite of the fact that none of us ever saw that, but we believe it, we didn't see it, yet we say seeing is believing, or is it? I recently saw this picture of the Pope on Twitter, and it went viral. Have you seen this before? Pretty cool dude, wouldn't you say? Uh, I saw this went viral. It was all over the internet. And, and, and people were commenting on the Pope and his fashion sense. But what's the problem? It's not real. It's a digital fake. And you can't tell the difference. And I can't either. And folks, we're quickly heading into a, 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 a season when AI and digital issues are coming up where we have to take everything very carefully to discern what is truth and what is false. We're quickly heading into some dangerous territory. But I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection is in fact the gold standard for historians of ancient times. The evidence is overwhelming. There are 11 different historical sources that point to him within 80 years of his life. Now you think about that. Alexander the Great, you've heard of him. There isn't a world history class in the world that would not talk about Alexander Great and his exploits. The first historical account of Alexander the Great is dated 300 years after his life. And yet we don't doubt the significance of Alexander. So let me ask you something. Who is changing lives for the better if it's not Jesus Christ? Yesterday, we had a funeral here for Jim Simonsik. It's a beautiful service. Pastor Tom Slater uh, shared for a few minutes on the, his life and how he had met with Jim for breakfast and Bible study for years every week. And he was remarking how often Jim would tell him, I am so glad for my wife, Penny, because without her, I would have never met Jesus, he said. You see, Jim's life was radically and beautifully changed by Christ. By the way, he's not the only one. I suspect that this room is filled with people who could say, Jesus changed my life and made a difference in what he's done for them. And the invitation is still, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives a great definition of faith. It says, faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. Do you believe? 
Now there's a third appearance in John 20 that I want to deal with for a couple of moments here, and, and that is the appearance of Jesus to Thomas. If Mary's reaction was feeling is believing, and these ten disciples, it was for them seeing is believing, Thomas's response was proving is believing. For some reason, Thomas wasn't there that first Sunday evening. He wasn't with the, the other group when Jesus appeared to them. When others then that week told him, Jesus appeared to us, he's really alive, we've seen him. Thomas, you remember, stubbornly answers, well, I'm not going to believe without some proof. He said, unless I put my finger where the nails were and my hands into the hole in his side, I'm not going to believe it. I must have proof. But notice how Jesus deals with Thomas. First, I, I noted, you know, he waits for a week. And I think there's a lesson there. Maybe you have a friend this morning, someone that you love who doesn't believe. Don't press the panic button. Maybe someone has been waiting for you. I told you about Jim Simonsik yesterday and sitting with Penny, and she told me yesterday, Pastor, I waited for years for him to come to Christ. He'd take me to church and sit in the car while the service was going on, smoke his pipe, and wait for me. And then I taught Sunday school, and he, helped, he had to help me bring the stuff in. And finally, one day, he stayed, <laughs> and his life was changed. It's okay if this takes time. So the next week, look at what happens. Verse 26, the disciples are, are meeting again. Same room, but Thomas is with them. The doors are locked, but Jesus shows up anyway, and he remarks, peace be with you. And he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand into my side. Stop doubting, Jesus says, and believe. Now, I note that Jesus didn't attack Thomas. He didn't chastise him because of his doubt. He just placed undeniable proof right in front of Thomas. And suddenly, Thomas humbly confesses and says, My Lord and my God. You know, someone here today says, You know, somebody could prove to me that God exists. I believe. If somebody would prove to me that Jesus really did get up out of that grave, I would not only believe, but I'd be a dedicated follower. But I'm not convinced. You know, I want to be truthful this morning. You're never going to have absolute proof. But how many times in your life do you base any decision you make on absolute certainty? Because if you did, you'd never do anything, would you? You'd never get married, I'll tell you that. You'd never take a job. You don't know if they're going to pay you or not. You wouldn't get in your car. You don't know what could happen out there. You wouldn't eat what your mother-in-law is going to serve for lunch. There's, who knows? You do it by faith. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. And so Jesus says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what's your reaction going to be? You see, our reaction to the news of Jesus' resurrection is in fact calling us that trusting is believing. I trust him. Faith is going to the edge of all the light we have and, and taking that next step. 
Faith is more than feeling because emotions fluctuate. They come and go. Faith doesn't demand seeing a supernatural sign every week to just keep it going. Faith doesn't require absolute proof because it isn't really faith then. That's just knowledge. Faith examines the evidence and then responds. And I think there is plenty of evidence to believe that Jesus Christ really got out of that grave. And so today, Christ is calling you and saying, you need to decide. Now, there are a couple of reasons you say, well, I don't want to. One of those, I think, is really, let's be honest, your sin. Maybe you don't believe, or at least you don't want to believe, because you know if you do believe, you're going to have to change some things. There are going to be some, some changes that occur. I, I saw a clipping that had two shipwrecked sailors who had been adrift for days, they were desperate on their little dinghy, and so one of the guys began to kneel on his, uh, on his knees and began to pray, Oh, Lord, I, don't, I know I haven't lived a, a good life. Lord, I've drunk too much booze. I've lied and cheated. I've done so many things I'm ashamed of, but Lord, if you'll save me, I promise. And at that, the other sailor interrupts, Don't say another word. I think I just spotted land. I thought that would go over better, but uh, I hope you get the point. We interrupt our decisions and think, I don't want to give up. My ways, my, my lifestyle, my attitudes. And so foolishly, we'd rather not believe and I'm convinced that our doubt is more about moral than intellectual issues. But the second problem, it seems to me, is really our egos. Remember when Ted Turner said, Christianity is for losers. I don't need anyone to die for me. You know, he is right. Christianity is for people who humbly admit they're lost and they realize in their own sin they can't conquer the grave. But maybe this morning each of us come to Jesus and like Thomas we say, Lord, I was wrong. Jesus, you're alive and I need you, my Lord, my God and I surrender to him. Friend, we're in the cave, but Jesus has made a way out. Trust him. Put your hope in him. And someone needs to do that today.